Um, so this event is part of our Void Engage program <coughs> and the Engage program has been in place since October 2014 and it's funded by the Derry City Council's Legacy uh, program and what the Engage program for Void Gallery is about, it's about literally throwing open the doors of the gallery and creating events that have meaning for the community and invite people to come in and experience the incredible art that we have on offer here. And this room is an example of that. We created a bespoke space for every exhibition called the Process Room, which is free and open to the public. And we encourage people to come in and respond to the exhibition and make art. <coughs> Children, older people. Uh, there's a sign on the wall that says, I'm too old to be enjoying this room, but I loved it. And that's what it's all about. Um, we do workshops, we work with artists, and we host events like this. And we're really proud to be working with Garden of Reflection and Artworks on this. Um, <coughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an introduction to the speakers that we have today. Sarah Chuck is our chair today and she's an arts and cultural practitioner. Her research and practice is based within the area of socially engaged and public art practice and theory. She led the National Development Agency for Collaborative Arts in Ireland, Co-Create, and she's a practitioner fellow with the Crick Centre, promoting the public understanding of politics at Sheffield University. She's also the author of After the Agreement, Contemporary Photography in Northern Ireland. Next is Sarah with Helen Marriage, who founded the Artichoke Trust in 2005 with Nikki Webb. Artichoke are the people who are responsible for bringing Temple to Derry this week, so I don't know if you've been to see it, but it's incredible. Um, Artichoke's aim is to work with artists to create extraordinary large-scale events that appeal to the widest possible audience. Artichoke believe that the arts should take place, they put on shows in unusual places, in the streets, public spaces, or in the countryside. <clears throat> Helen's previous work includes a seven year period as director of the Salisbury Festival, creating the first arts and events programme for the developers of Canary Wharf in London, and she was also an associate director of the London International Festival of Theatre. Interestingly, here on Skype, we have Anne Donnelly, and Anne is a Northern Irish artist who works mainly with video and photography, often in a response to a sense of place. Anne has been involved in virtually their kids' own virtual residency programme since the further field phase in spring 2009 and received an ACES award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland to support and develop her work with the project. In both solo practice and collaborative projects, she continues to explore themes of being and belonging and her work has been exhibited at internationally. And we've recently just come out of a project working with Anne through Kids' Own where we uh, delivered a series of artists' creative exchange projects with Anne linking in virtually. So, that's a, we're, we're continuing on that conversation with her through Skype. And then finally, last but not least, we have Declan Sheehan, who works as a social innovator with Visual Arts at Holywell Trust, devising projects to make connections between themes in contemporary visual art and ideas in social innovation, and making connections between opportunities for artists' practice and opportunities for social enterprise. Declan has a background as a director, a project director, curator, a film producer for various photography, art and film projects in Ireland on both sides of the border. Okay, uh, welcome. Um, yeah, because this is a conversation, so I'm hoping it'll be very dialogical so that you'll be invited to be part of the conversation and uh, ask questions to the panellists. Broadly speaking, the conversation is going to be about how artists respond in terms of their practice, respond to questions of place and people. Um, and obviously this practice is oftentimes called socially engaged practice or largely public art practices. Um, so just to kick off, what we're going to do is one by one um, have the artists actually introduce their practice so there's some context to the conversation that then follows on. So we'll first uh, turn to Anne who's Skyped, really to look at the question of place and people, because obviously this is a virtual conversation and a virtual practice. So if maybe, Anne, if you want to really explain what it is that you do. Hi, Anne. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm working from my studio, which is in my home, which is in a field, uh, which is the bottom right-hand corner of Lognay, and I can just show you. Um, I'm literally looking out onto a field today. And I work like this with... Um, a little school up in rural county Tyrone. I've been working like this for uh, six or seven years on a, a pioneering project called Virtually There. And it seeks to connect the artists in their studio with um, children in the classroom. And it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing. And I suppose it, it pertains to that idea of place that you said, um, as in, I'm really here today. It's a real conversation. And hopefully it'll feel like that for everybody who's involved. Um, so it'll be interesting maybe to have a bit of discussion later and see if the virtual had an effect on 
uh, my participation or how you perceive me as part of the, the conversation. And just next, if we can maybe, uh, Helen, if you can describe your work with Artichoke. So I wouldn't say that I was an artist. Um, I'm a producer and I work, uh, as was said at the beginning, to create very large scale, high impact events that appeal to the broadest possible public. We try and make them uh, universally accessible and we try very hard to make them of the highest possible quality, the kind of thing that you might expect to see in a dedicated arts building with the production values being really important. A lot of what we do also involves working with local communities, uh, local to the place that we're, we're producing. So uh, the temple project that we're currently uh, working on has involved hundreds of people from here over a number of months, both paid and volunteers. Um, the aim is to create something that is always ephemeral, always goes away, uh, but lives in the memory forever. And uh, I'm a curator and um, I suppose the common theme across lots of the projects that I've created is that idea of a sense of place or connecting, a, uh, connecting an artist or connecting an archive or connecting a certain theme in art practice to a sense of place. So that could be everything from delving into the archive of Troubles Photography of Derry and uh, working on the Picturing Derry project here um, in 2013 to another project setting up a potting shed, a little kind of mini allotment affair in Fort Dunry, a disused military fort over the border. If I can just return it, Helen, because you're in a way a provocation as a producer because you're going into places that you're not necessarily from, so you're not embedded. So in terms of that response to place and the critical questions of community and, and the project being embedded within a community, how do you navigate maybe a lack of intimate knowledge with place in which you're then producing a project within? Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, the Lumiere that we did here in 2013, which some of you may have seen, took us 18 months to set up. It may have only appeared on the streets for four days, but that 18 months was spent getting to know people, uh, working with them, getting to understand as far as an outsider ever can, the sort of sensitivities and the sensibilities that, that are resident within a place. And then sometimes doing a variety of different things, sometimes working with those things, sometimes working to oppose them, sometimes provoking, there's a sort of sense of challenge in some of the stuff that we do, but also a sense of surprise and most importantly, delight. That's what we really want people to um, to come away with a sense that they saw stuff that they would never have imagined and that the very familiar landscape, both internal and external, has been transformed. And what's also changed is the way that they feel about that space and the people that they share it with. So in everything we do, whether that's here in Derry or whether um, over the water in uh, Durham, where we work every two years, or in London, Liverpool, we've, we've always tried to create events which destroy or do away with territorial boundaries and try to offer something just for a moment that is on offer to everybody equally. That I sense that you're like a provisional community that you're producing through, is it a provisional sense of community that you're creating? I don't know about provisional, it's a sense of community. I mean, if you go up to the top of the hill, that's very definitely a community where people are sharing an experience and they're coming from all parts of the city and all parts beyond and they're, um, they're a community but maybe only for a week but their legacy will last I'm sure. I think the, the question of community it, it's something that's oftentimes the problematic of any kind of uh, discussion about this kind of work but obviously it's a it's a term that has a, its problematic nature is amplified in the context of Northern Ireland. Um, or the North of Ireland. Indeed, and that's the problematic nature of it. So, 
with regard to that, I'm just wondering in terms of you're, create, you're creating a virtual community, um, how that challenge of, of actually having a, a meaning of community that is something that can be challenged as well as, um, in a way, enacted, how you do that. Um, well, the place that I work with has a real sense of community, as in it's a, a little rural place. Um, and I suppose what I'm bringing to that, in some ways it's similar to what Helen's bringing. You're, you're coming as an outsider, you're bringing a different set of ideas, a different set of practices and skills and a different perspective. And for me, what it's allowing the, the children that I'm working with in Danahi, I, I mean, I've worked with a whole range of ages and types of people over you know, all different generations over years. But in Denahi specifically, I'm working with sort of quite young children. And what I find there is that their sense of place and their sense of community um, perhaps wasn't fully formed at the point where I was meeting them, that it was, it was beginning, but it hadn't sort of sealed over. And what I was trying to add to that with them, it's, it's a microcosm of, of the, the scale of work that some of the others are, are working on. Um, we were trying to get them just to look at their places that they came from, to engage with them in a different way, to maybe look at family archives and family history, to get names for old photos, just something as simple as, you know, this is an old photograph and, and I have no idea who these people are, and to have conversations with their parents, with their grandparents, and find out who are these people, um, where do I actually live, what's my timeline called? Um, so we sort of, through the project, um, working very closely with the teacher, it's a partnership very much. I'm not coming in and imposing. I have a lot of planning and a lot of conversations to try and figure out where's the common ground. So I suppose we have to find common ground in terms of subject matter. Um, you know, I can't come in and just impose. You know, I'm interested in this, so therefore we will do. We have to find a place where I can offer something and then the children can find a way to engage with that and also the teacher can justify it in terms of having it within a school day, that it's a valuable addition to their, to their lives and to their school day and to the curriculum. So it's, it's kind of a, an evolving balance. Um, so yeah, I very much feel like I'm making offers and I'm, I'm trying to make creative offers. Um, and because I'm interested in history and I'm interested in place, I suppose quite often we, we kind of come back to this, but in radically different ways. So, it could be through looking at the present and uh, for the last eight weeks, for example, there have been children going out to take photographs of the same place every single day to see what's changed. So that's a very sort of simple idea of looking at place and becoming aware of, of where you live. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a, a set of work called Dwell, which was all about family history and, and landscape. Um, last year, we were working on, they, they had little memory boxes and. Um, they were bringing in things that meant something to them from when they were young, you know, maybe parents had kept little booties or birth certificates or um, little toys, and the children were photographing these, so they were kind of finding out um, sort of the reality of the object. What is this? Why am I keeping it? What value does it have for me? What story does it tell? So lots of different ways of, in, of engaging with identity and place and the stories that you tell about yourself. And I suppose that's where the parallels are with my work, but their stories are their stories, and I'm trying to kind of draw them out. In terms of the kind of collaborative ethos with which you work, at what yeah, level yeah. are also the, the partners part of that, as in the, the, if you're working within a school context, the teachers are also part of that collaborative ethos? It's a total partnership. Um, uh, I mean, for today, for example, um, if somebody didn't want me to be here, they can literally just switch off the computer. <laughs> it's kind of, you're slightly more vulnerable than if you're there yeah, physically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have to uh, go through all sorts of very kind of basic technical things in order just to be there, in order just to make my presence felt. So on a very basic level, just establishing that contact and getting over the technical issues took a little while. Um, we're also using Pioneer technology, so we're using not Skype like we use today, but we're using a thing where it's an interactive whiteboard and um, if the children take a photograph on a webcam, it appears instantly on my screen. Uh, if I take a photograph, it appears instantly on their screen. I can type, we have instant chats. They also have video and audio. So it's a very full way of kind of sharing the experiences. But at the same time, it's showcasing their work immediately. You're seeing process immediately. 
um, and it's it's kind of an instant record of the conversations that we're having. And a lot of the work is about conversation. So I'm interested in what Helen was saying about the top of the hill, about the community. That community has come obviously from from people who are having conversations, who are engaging in a, in a shared idea, and they're they're buying into it and they're feeling part of it. I think that's really really crucial. I think what's interesting about what's happening up there is that in terms of place is that for lots of people in the city it's a place that they've never been to they see it every day you see it as you look up over the you know across from the peace bridge or wherever you're looking but very few people that we're encountering have ever actually stood there and looked down on the city and had that incredible view so the project itself is doing one thing but one of the things about locating it there is it's giving back to people here a, a place that for some has been either irrelevant or off limits or whatever it's been. And we were asked why we didn't put it in what was called a shared space. And actually, I thought about it a lot, and the answer is technical and logistical. It's too big and complicated to do anywhere that's smaller than that. But the real answer is that is that the places that aren't shared will never become shared unless you create an opportunity for people to go there and to go there without the kind of uh, fears and anxieties and prejudices that they might otherwise bring with them. So it is a kind of desire to break something down a bit that put it up there. There's a kind of correlation because what you were describing was a kind of a mapping and that's a kind of a, a remapping of a city yeah. by an intervention. Is there a correspondence with your work, Declan? I suppose across various projects, that sense of community is always problematised. I mean, within the arts, visual arts framework especially, and especially working outside of kind of metropolitan centres. So I would be working, presenting arts projects with an organisation, Art Link in Fort Dunree, so rural Donegal. So you're away from art schools, you're away from a high footfall of art students, things like that. And so you've even got a visual arts community itself, which in terms of inclusion and exclusion can feel as excluded as many other kind of um, marginalised communities that their, their voice, their perspective isn't felt within the kind of broader body politic or the broader kind of social mores of that society. Um, so that would be resolved, like we did a project with an art link, with a artist taking a quite kind of innovative contemporary art project to uh, rural agriculture fairs, so uh, cattle shows and things like that. So you immediately kind of lifted the artist out of their community of um, uh, kind of fellow feeling and fellow travellers. And reputation as well. Yeah, exactly. And then out into this other setting completely. And that kind of engagement and that kind of friction was where the kind of energy of the project rested, really. And it's interesting then with Helen, before we turned on the mics, you were saying, for David, this is a very different community engaging with his temple piece than in Burning Man, because it's families and multi-generational. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like Burning Man, which is a kind of yep. utopia itself. I've been to but it. But it connects, it, it is a real community, international in nature, I suppose, but all coming to that place. A community of shared interest is, is the... And of a particular age range in yeah. general and all of that stuff. But there is a kind of a connection now between the community as place and that community of shared interest. Yeah. But part kind of allied to that is a question really of, around the authorship of the work. Now obviously I know there's a difference between the self-naming as whether you're an artist or whether you're a producer, but there's an underlying question of how the sense of the authorship of the work actually becomes a process which is genuinely collaborative. Can you explain how you may... Because you didn't use... I suppose, yeah, I suppose collaborativeness... Um, it's it's a spectrum across. So that's so not every project I would be working towards would aim for the yeah. full degree of collaboration. There's something quite like I, I I can predict I predict that for that project in the agricultural show, where the person used the artist used um, for for semen donation by like bulls. 
So it was like it looked at like kind of commercial world of of agriculture and cattle and things like that. She made uh, like wheat garlands, so traditional kind. Of, she was taking kind of traditional craft techniques and using the utmost kind of contemporary agricultural technology. And then these kind of big garlands were presented to the winning cattle on the day. Now. I don't know if she would have reached that point if her project had been collaborative from the very start. It's always a different... So that, that was very much more of an interventionist piece mm. in some sense. Um, whereas other kind of projects... I can't think of one at the moment that's, that's at the other spectrum. But you've got people coming in and they're working with communities and they're thinking of the theme and they're thinking of the materials. Mm. And it's very much... A, longer stage process that quite often it involves a much further commitment. I'd say like the work I'm doing is very durational, very kind of, it only works properly if it's over an extended period of time and if there's a real foundational sense of kind of interacting with the community and getting to know them. Well certainly um, I used to be the director of Create and they used to manage the, uh, the South's um, Artists in the Community Scheme and one of the clear kind of uh, provisos for being successful in the funding application is to identify the level of kind of co-authorship so the community that you're working with their collaboration with the artist is absolutely uh, foundational uh, to the scheme itself and to the funding um, but that brings me to an interesting question in terms of the work that you do Helen insofar as you're working with artists who conceive their idea and then you try and find the points of navigation within a location. Am I right in thinking? Because I know we kind of had a, we worked mildly together over the Sultan Elephant um, and that was a vision that was in place. So. Yeah, no, I think that we don't. I mean, I think what you've just described in terms of that process with Create, that is a, what should I say? I'm really old, and I, within funding uh, systems, I've seen things come and go and be fashionable and not fashionable. And when I first started, you couldn't get money for projects that involved what were called amateurs, because that wasn't considered to be what Arts Council or other funding was about. Over time, over my lifetime of work, you've gone through you know education outreach learning participation co-creation collaboration it all changes and but what's changing i think those funding systems change in response to the ways that artists are working as opposed to so they the funding systems are very often catching up with what's actually going on out there so you know things happening not in designated buildings or found spaces suddenly that becomes something interesting because artists are doing it anyway so people buy into that so i never i don't necessarily ever agree with what a funding system is telling me i should or shouldn't do i think that artichoke has a really clear idea about what it wants to do but absolutely no definition of what an artichoke project is it's whether an interesting artist has an interesting idea that we can find a context for that um, will blow people's minds. That's, that's, the, that's the aim. So we don't start with any prescription that says this project can only happen if you know, 27 communities are engaged in it. I might well and have in the past do a project for an audience of one person at a time that is completely a different kind of thing. But it's always about... For me, anyway, as a producer, it's always about impact. It's about how you can change people's minds, how you can get people who not only aren't interested, but absolutely know they're not interested in the arts to suddenly find delight in something that's in front of them. And that's always the guide. And if the funding body says, I'm sorry, that doesn't meet our criteria, then I find the money somewhere else. But in suggesting that you use the word impact, and I think anyone who's ever been uh, involved in doing a funding application, you normally have to kind of give some sense of what the impact of the practice will be and to give some sense of evidencing. And I think that maybe is a question for all of us at this juncture because we're in the midst of the idea of the legacy uh, within this city. So 
how, you know, the, the legacy is a, is a language, a critical language, which is often used, but actually I think needs a little bit of unpacking. I mean, you earlier spoke about things live on in the imagination, but that's a quite a difficult thing. Those personal memories are quite a difficult or insufficiently attractive for funders to really um, respond to or difficult for an artist to articulate this is, was the impact on a piece of work. Um, Could I come in there? There's, a, yeah. there's an interest in my current project with Hollywell Trust, um, so it, it ties in art practice and it was geared around that idea of legacy to 2013. So that was the, the funding that came from my post um, and two other people working in, in different kind of fields, but it was looking at the legacy of 2013. But it takes ideas from kind of social innovation and social enterprise, and I suppose social enterprise is what most people would be aware of in terms of like it's a, it's a business with community benefit. So if you're pushing an artist towards a social enterprise practice, it might to some degree be making their their current practice into something more sustainable financially, either through evolving a service or evolving a product or, um, you know, that's a very kind of, as broad as it is, it is still very monorail system, moving people towards um, a, a degree of success and failure across one very narrow spectrum. Whereas social innovation is something much wider it's aiming towards the ultimate is kind of systemic change. So you may completely rethink childcare provision for a whole community, but the process of getting there may be a whole series of experiments and failures, and you give yourself the freedom to do that, and you kind of make different allies and make different partners, and across that period of time, hopefully the, the maximum result is this systemic change. And that kind of systemic change is what is really difficult to factor into a funding application or to an idea of a legacy or, because I think 2013 was really a systemic change here, but probably not in a way that you could tick boxes about audience figures and things like that. It's more the way that the, the communities here internalized it has really led to systemic change in the way that people think about what is possible, what isn't possible, I think that's interesting, this idea that um, you can see things differently, you know, that you suddenly see your city or your area or your landscape or your life or your possibilities differently. And I think sometimes when things go really well in a project, you get that little moment where it allows people to change their focus and change their idea of what they thought they could be or how they saw the world or how they tell their story. And whether it's on a very personal level or whether it's on a a sort of city-wide level, I think that arts can help people to do that because it, it does present a way of looking at the world. I think that's what maybe we have to offer as creative people is potentially a different way of doing that. But this, the language of, of connecting arts to a kind of a, a radical imagination of how things might otherwise be. Um, or not even just how they might otherwise be, but even as they are seeing the reality differently. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm just wondering about, um, this might be unfashionable, but ideas of discontent, because I always feel slightly nervous, whereby um, producers or artists are supposed to be doing some work that produces a quality of well-being. And then I sometimes wonder, what about producing a piece of work that actually uncovers a more critical sense of discontent, which is another way of looking at the present, which is not the language of well-being, which is actually what is anticipated or is currently expected. Um, Could I just jump in there? I had a really funny one. We were working with a, a community in uh, Killicomain in Portadown, which is, they described themselves as being on the other side of the ban. So they were not part of Portadown, they were separate. And uh, we did a disposable camera project with them. And one of the things that they did was uh, photograph potholes in the road. And they selected this as one of the, the images that they wanted to show everyone else. And it was about their discontent and not being listened to. And it's, it's a really aesthetically ugly image, but it's also a really interesting and really powerful image that expresses their sense of not being listened to. Uh, I thought it was a really, 
typical from this area, from where I come from anyway, but um, it was kind of funny, but they only saw it sort of half funny. They, they, they kind of took it quite seriously. And um, so I think it is a way of, of people sort of, it doesn't always have to be feel good, yeah. It reminds me there was a project by, uh, a really excellent project by Seamus Snowland in Ballymun in uh, Dublin where they were knocking the tower blocks down. So he worked with the residents of the tower block that was, you know, going to be demolished. And they took over the, the top floor. And the people that were been formerly the resident, they basically opened a hotel. They called it Hotel Ballyman. And so what you did in terms of audience, you booked a night to be uh, basically as if it were a hotel room in the tower. So the whole project was really a critique of kind of poverty tourism. Um, it was, I, I found it a really astonishing uh, piece of work. So it was part of a public art practice, but it was very, very clear in terms of its political, in, political and social intent that was very much led by the former residents of the... So it didn't fit in with the, the usual arts practice and regeneration um, mm. story. I mean, there is that idea of a project concluding with a degree of, like an enhanced degree of agitation or a, a, a recognition of discontent. It, it, it's, un, it's unusual, but it can, it will quite often come at a project with, from a different direction, from an unexpected direction. I mean, I know that some of the media will like take on David Best and, and Temple as ultimately feel good, as you said, you know what I mean, that's, that's the one line. Or the uh, priest I've just been uh, responding to who has said that it's, um, it's an example of <coughs> paganism and idolatry and that, um, you know, the Bible inveighs against the temple of Baal and how we've simply gone down that line and is encouraging his followers to have nothing whatsoever to do with it. Yeah. Oh, that's a critique you've received. Uh -huh. And when I've shown it to some people, literally like almost, almost kind of scripted, the first thing they said was how much did that cost? Do you know what I mean? So instantly, it, it, the, the feel good factor for a big kind of community project or lots of projects, for example, in 2013, um, even though it's the factor that's written up by the media and it's kind of given most public voice in the media and broadcasting, it doesn't mean necessarily that on the ground it's, it is the sense that people carry with them. You know what I mean? There's a, and a kind of transformational sense that I, I gather will be the kind of sense of kind of temple isn't, shouldn't be written as feel good as such. It may be transformational you come out and you're more <laughs> angry with the current state of affairs mm -hmm. than uh, you were prior to it, that it's, it's, it's transformed your scale of ambition, your scale of hopes, your scale of expectations. So it isn't just that, well, this has given me a really good inner sense, so now I can engage with everything as it is in a more wholesome way. It may be you go out and you say, I'm going to engage with everything in a much more articulate way, in a much more agitated way, in a much more productive way. Well, Helen, how, how do you, are you proposing to kind of evaluate the project? How are you going to undertake that? When we do anything, we, interestingly not with this one, but normally we do, uh, um, we commission independent evaluation. So that can be everything from measuring economic impact through to well-being, discontent. We do a whole series of both online and in-person surveys. We measure, I don't know, increased numbers of bed nights and we do all of that kind of stuff so that we can come up with some metrics because, as you say, funders like the numbers, but with this one it didn't seem appropriate to do that and it really doesn't seem appropriate to be interviewing people, particularly people who've come out of the place in some distress or, you know, have had a very kind of personal um, experience the last thing we want to do is go up to them with a clipboard and say you know how did that make you feel today so I think with this one <coughs> we'll you know measure the value of the advertising equivalents of the amount of press coverage getting we'll do all of that kind of stuff but actually I'm not a great I don't think that the metrics tell you the answers I think that you know 
anyone who's fallen in love will know that you can measure it. You can say, I've been in love five times and I've had, you know, one marriage and this many children and, you know, any of us in this room, we could enumerate all the numbers around falling in love, but none of that tells you what it feels like. And the answer is, you just know what it feels like. And this project is, as with Lumia before, it's something that we offered hopefully, in a way, but hoping that people would like it, engage with it, get something out of it, feel differently about the place um, and about that experience. And I think certainly with Lumia that's the case and we'll only know on Sunday morning as we shovel ash in the predicted torrential rain which is coming, um, that whether it's you know had that kind of impact or not, but in the end, you know, I don't really mind about not having a set of numbers about around it. And then the in interesting thing is I don't think you'll know on Monday on Monday morning or Sunday morning. You'll probably know in twenty thirty six or yeah. something when someone releases an album and they kind yeah. of have been yeah. Yeah. they trace back their levels of inspiration or yeah. Those kind of transformative moments. Like, or, oh, the, or what's really interesting is the yeah, we've run, run a series of apprenticeships. I'm sure many of you will know that we run a back to work scheme for unemployed carpenters. We've run 40 apprenticeships. We're working in 20 schools. There's tons of stuff that we've done. And what's interesting, you can see already, is the life change that has really been made with some of the younger people who have worked on the project. I mean, you can see they actually look different, it's kind of extraordinary. And their ambition to do other things um, is really palpable, you can see the difference. I think one of the things about a project of that scale though is that um, there is a sense that it has a global kind of connectedness. And I think that um, it's that link between a very specific place and doing something in a specific place at a specific time, but also having an eye to how that sits in the global context and making feel, people feel connected to and other The eye of the in, world in is the world. suddenly on here. That's what's been interesting, that people have a sense that everybody else is looking at the top of the hill, Derry. It's a kind of funny thing that the spotlight has, has in relation to this project, briefly turned in this direction. And that, that's a really good thing, I think. That, Absolutely. And I think it's that same thing of, you know, you can do it in a small way or a big way, but it's turning your focus to a different, yeah. you know, we feel different because we're being looked at differently, because we're being asked a different set of questions. Um, and I think that could be at the core of, of a lot of good, engaged practice. It's interesting, Anne, when you're working with children and you were talking about them almost establishing their sense of community how maybe kind of problematic that is in some ways, because it's all probably all about inclusion and exclusion. Like the, there's the cliche of like kids being really distressed watching a famine on TV news and the parents saying, oh, that's okay, that's not here. You know, so you're, you're kind of creating those barriers it, it, and not meaning any ill by it. What you're trying to do is bring a sense of well-being, and it's just you're, engaged, you're, you're trying to gauge what capacity the child of that age has. But I mean, the, like children will look at maps and the, it'll always be where are we and trying to find that focus and trying to find where they're not. But um, I, I don't know if that goes back, Sarah, to some of the kind of problematics of community that you were interested in in terms of in inclusion and exclusion. Yeah. It's also, well, it is such a very difficult term. Um, so in a community, the ethos of community can be fantastic, but it also is founded on the idea that you're not part of, you know, it has a, it's bounded. So the idea of how do you actually make community something that's actually really quite porous and that anyone can join and also anyone can leave at any time. So there's something really unfixed about it and without boundary is, and that's the idea of working virtually. I'm wondering, to what level that actually helps create a sense of something being slightly more porous in terms of points of entry and, and... Well, I think I have leave to ask obvious questions. I can, um, I can kind of almost play a fool or be a joker style character because I can ask really simple questions and I can, I can make sure that people have a very basic understanding of, of literally what road you live on, where you are. I can be 
stupid about things and not know and it's all right and then that allows other people to not know things and to be able to find them out and let's find them out together so i think there is a real value in that that i'm not coming as in as the expert on their area and they know more than i do which i think is really helpful um in terms of community i mean in education in northern ireland most schools um are one or the other in terms of community and um, there's not that many integrated schools and um, so i was really interested when i asked about history i was unsure as to what the children would come back with you know whether there would be anything in there that was in any way controversial or difficult or anything that they had problems with you know taking in and one of the fascinating things is like uh, at the bottom of one of the children's lanes, she had an orange hall, and she said she wanted to research the orange hall, and I was thinking, I wonder what she'll find out. And she came back and said, in the orange hall, on a Tuesday night, they have flower arranging, and on a Thursday night, they have yoga. <laughs> and I thought that was amazing. It's just like, that's a totally fresh perception of an orange hall. She doesn't see it with any other trappings or any other issues around it or points of view around it and similarly some of the kids were looking at um, Tullyhog Fort which is the inauguration site of the O'Neill's which is a couple of miles from from their school and it's kind of a very ancient ceremonial site and some of the kids went and explored it and, and tried to find out about it and again it was a, it was a kind of part of history that they might not have otherwise looked at um, they were looking at uh, the Civil War, as they called it, had affected them back in... Uh, one of the children said that uh, the church beside where they lived had been burnt down in 1641. But they were coming in with this information and they weren't quite understanding <coughs> all the impact or how the threats played out over the course of history. But the fact that they'd started to engage, you know, it, it, it allows them to have markers that they can go back to and say, yeah, I have a landscape now that I can start to navigate and I can, you know, things aren't excluded that might have been excluded otherwise. So in, in your practice, are you working, are you initiating dialogues between the schools? Um, no, not at the moment. We'd love to, but um, we're not at this point. Um, funny enough, in another project I'm doing at the minute, we're going around um, 12 different schools in Ireland, North and South, and we're asking them to research um, the 10-year period between 1912 and 1922. Um, and all of the things that have happened in that 10 years and it could be anything that catches their eye and at this point in time you have people finding out about pioneer aviation that was happening in their area and you have people researching suffragettes and you have people researching the lockout in 1913 and you have people looking at linen and you've you know so this huge kind of and the children are choosing what they're what they're researching so i think similarly it's this idea of allowing someone, you know, opening up a subject, giving somebody an understanding of what the possible scope is, you know, let's look at this kind of thing, but not having an end view of, of where it's going to go. And if you're doing this type of work and you know where it's going to finish, for me, what's the point? If you know what the end product is before you start, and if you've had to put it on a fund application and you say, you know, A, B and C are going to work together for X number of weeks and at the end they will produce Y, I would think again, that that's maybe not the kind of project I'd like to be part of for me because if I want to work and engage with people, I want something to change for me and for them and I want something unexpected to happen and I want it to open up and I want it to be something more than I had imagined, sometimes different, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but I want it to be open. That, that sense of contingency and keeping a process open so that you can, it can surprise you. Um, it's actually a very difficult thing to actually manage. So there's also how do you manage to keep a process open? Um, can you, how you actually um, go about that? Because that is actually rather difficult. Yeah. Because you've got to conclude a project. As a creator, that's when you then get to blame the artist that they got it wrong. Sorry. Um, no, I think it's as you're really a creator. It's important for everyone else. That's what I'm saying. This is something that I'm really interested in. So it's, it's not a prerequisite in any way of a project. Yeah, there's a. 
I suppose it's an awkward question to answer because I almost would avoid ever going into a project which was the opposite. No, I yeah. know that but as if long you know as it you've doesn't leave this room, you've we got all an fill in point. funding applications and we all say what you have to say in funding applications to get it through. But at the same time, if you've been kind of long enough in the game or whatever, you realise that certain expectations are realisable and certain, certain expectations are not. And to like solve 800 years of colonialism and post-colonialism in one art project, which is quite often what you will write down, essentially, in your paragraph, saying Are what will be the benefit. Are you able to do that every time? That's amazing. That's just, <laughs> haven't you seen the amazing success happening constantly? But I mean, there's a, that's the worst side of it, to be honest, because then it probably does lead to this kind of jaded sense of, oh my God, what's possible, what isn't? Like, I've been reading about voice, because I'm, so looking at ideas of social innovation and, uh, socially engaged practice and things like that. An idea of it being presented as new. I mean, when Boyce was going around Northern Ireland, Joseph Boyce, the artist, was going around Northern Ireland in 1974, there was all of these kind of interesting ideas were there, and they were there in a really, in a way that was probably impossible for a lot of people on the ground to understand at the time. Impossible for lots of kind of funders or powers that be to kind of understand and lots of the communities he was engaging with were looking at him scant saying, what are you talking about? Where are you, where are you going with these ideas or what's happening? Mm. Some of them were saying we're doing these kind of things already, but... I'm just, it's a question of duration. Yeah. Like, some projects are quite short mm. in terms of, sort of the conclusion as to the end point of that project and the project ceasing. And then some projects or an artist working within a community or with a community is a longer process but that duration that time actually has some kind of consequence and how that plays out um, because Helen a lot of your projects are they have a very finite uh, presence they're there and then they're gone and the, the legacy is memory have you ever done a project which is of a more durational uh, Anthony Gormley's One Another that lasted a hundred days and non-stop. Uh, so this was a project in London in, the, in Trafalgar Square, the ceremonial heart of London, where um, uh, there's Nelson's column. And then, have, you, have many of you been there to Trafalgar Square? So there's Nelson's column in the middle with the four lions, and then there are four plinths, and three of them have statues on them and one of them doesn't and it's used as a as a platform for contemporary art it usually lasts a year and a half or so um so it's a sort of exhibition space and anthony gormley's project was to inhabit that space which was 24 feet up in the air eight feet wide and three feet broad um with a single human being every hour for uh a hundred days and nights, so that's 2,400 people, 2,400 hours, no interval, no break, all filmed, so the rest of the world could see if we ever messed up, left it empty, whatever, whatever, whatever. So the pressure to run that project was extraordinary, and it had to look seamless and easy, and we had to get the people there, and all of that stuff it was very, very com logistically complicated and very smooth on the outside, but in terms of uh, duration, that was the test. That was a real test. I love the fact as well with the work that you're doing, the conversations that happen before you even start. Uh, yeah. I'm really interested in, in yeah. the kind of pre-project conversations. Yeah, they're so very long. Where, where an yeah. idea comes from. So the projects themselves always appear short. I mean, 100 days isn't short, but it's, you know, it's a finite amount of time. But that project took two years to set up, and during that time, that was all about persuading people about how we might do things. The project here in, in Derry in 2013, that was 18 months or so of conversations with people here and with the artists coming and visiting and thinking about what they might make and then making it and coming back and testing it. And it's a, the, the projects themselves are only the climax. The, the process is, is a very long thing that goes before and sometimes away again. And then I've seen within socially engaged practice at the moment, for example, this piece in Fort Dunry in Donegal, the artist Christine Mackey has established a potting shed. So the whole site is in, predominantly in ruins, it's a military fort. 
and she researched the local um, ecology of the area and established a potting shed with then six, six uh, beds there for people and she handed out kind of seeds from the area and things like that. But that seems to be like a common trope almost amongst lots of current socially engaged practice projects are um, they almost leave a resource with the community. Yeah. Which then turns gift. that idea of duration on its head almost because it's when does the duration of that piece yeah. finish? You know, Christine Mackey will be involved <laughs> at a further stage with this potting shed, but it's, it might be there for five years, it might be there for 15 years. She's relatively hands off now and she's handed on the guardianship of it mm. to a different group. And so the, that makes that idea of gauging the success or the failure yeah. of a project really problematic. Because actually, in that then the artist is just a catalyst and the legacy is actually there's a community ownership. Um, I think it's probably a juncture to actually create a bit of community ownership on this conversation. So I'm just wondering whether, um, from what's been spoken, whether people have any questions to direct to <coughs> any of the panellists, either based on what's been said already or a question or an area that hasn't actually been addressed. And I apologise if anybody, if I'm not looking at you because I pointed in a particular direction. So. <laughs> <laughs> I go, this will help. <laughs> I'd like to ask the panellists if they could share with us an example of socially engaged practice at work, you know, where they've seen it happen and happen brilliantly and, and themselves be inspired by it so that we can all take notes and Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Now just what have you seen that's really cool and where is it working really well? Who's doing it super, in a super way? I think Deirdre O'Mahony's XPO project down, which county is it? Clare is it? Uh, I thought it was Sligo. Uh, and, it's, it's, but, and, and that works, I think, because it's probably wrong to call it a project. You know, it's had so many different iterations, it's evolved over so many different phases. So she took over a... Uh, a uh, disused post office in a little village um, and uh, I think the initial project was local history research and then out of that the group formed it then took on ownership of it and now, and now she's fairly hands off and it's probably critical to some extent of some of the things that happens there but it's really kind of evolved a, a kind of community meeting point, community access point, a little energy point in this area that um, it's, it, that on its own is a real success, I think. I am very inspired by loads of work that goes on, all different kinds, but I really love um, Room 13. It's a really interesting project. Um, it started off as a, an unpaid artist residency um, in a little school in, near Fort William, out in the sticks. And an artist took over a spare room in the school and over years and years uh, they have established an incredible arts practice. They've been exhibited in really eminent museums, they're part of collections all over the world. They design Christmas cards from the art, for the Arts Council and for big organisations and they're a little tiny school in rural Scotland and I was lucky enough to do some research with them um, a few years ago and it's an ongoing thing, it's evolved to an organisation that works all over the world now. But it's the idea with Room 13, the artist works alongside the children, the children are artists as well, and they learn from each other, and their practice evolves together. It's, it's really fascinating. Yeah. I think there's a great uh, example in uh, Chicago with the Astor Gates, who's an incredible African-American artist who works in the south of Chicago in a place called Dorchester, where he um, is buying up buildings, old banks, various extraordinary uh, clapped out houses, various things, and he's turning that into a resource, arts resource for his own community. His, he is already a, a practicing artist and most of the money that he makes um, goes back into the community to further those aims. Uh, he just won the Arts Art in Mundo Prize in Cardiff and immediately um, divided the prize money of £40,000 between the 10 nominees rather than saying that's great I'll take it for myself. He's got a very extraordinary generous spirit and, and around his practice in, uh, in Chicago you can go and see there's the Black Cinema House, there's all kinds of work that's happening in these buildings that he's remaking 
but also in the streets around. He's really changing the way that that community, and he lives there, he lives and in the house. he's just done work with that organization, Young Chicago Authors, yeah. and they've just launched their festival program, and Young Chicago Authors are a really interesting organization yeah. for anyone to look at, because it's about spoken word, and they gather hundreds and hundreds of young people together to uh, communicate their story through performance and spoken word, and it's incredible. He's really remarkable, and yeah. he's just been made professor at Chicago University, which is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but they, he, it, the impact that he's having on that community is really incredible. I'm interested in the Helen, uh, the shared space doesn't become a shared space until people go there. You know, they brought up the city and everything is probably a perfect example yeah. of it. You know, uh, an impressive place, you would have never went there until somebody decided to build a bridge across. Yeah. Now it's, it's uh, an art space, brilliant space to be in. The same, uh, the walls, like I'd done a project with uh, Deglin on the walls. And when I was growing up, I looked up at the walls as military installations, you know, like an oppressive uh, place. And it wasn't the Good Friday Agreement. I actually walked the full circumference of the walls, you know, and it, so it's, and it, now I think of that space as an art gallery, a performance space, you know, a place to, for people to work on. No, not in the way, that I, that I was brought up to look at it, you know, because obviously military installations looking down at the community you know, in, 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 in an oppressive way. I think that's really interesting, that sense of possibility again, isn't it? That you see something and you see how it could be different and you, if you're inspired to keep going in whatever practice you're at. It doesn't mean you have to do the same thing, but it's just like these kind of things are possible. And I think that's really, Really I think what's interesting to a degree is the, the kind of projects we all chose in response to Sally's question were kind of catalysts to some degree. It was, now I'm not sure, what my, my fear is that, is that an internal thing within the arts world that, that we prefer catalysts because we've all grown very tired of you put up a show, it finishes, you put up another show, it finishes, you, put, you know what I mean, it's a bit of a hamster wheel to that and that but does the does the punter, to be blunt, prefer a great exhibition? You know what I mean. It's kind of all these projects are great, and I would kind of critique the one I mentioned as much as anyone else's. But is there a quality control at the end of all of this? Like that project in Chicago, is it great because it exists, or is it great because? The work is great. The work that is eventually made in it is great. The work or is the continually made. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. That's only a question, really. I haven't resolved that yet. But I'm very. I'm. I'm wary of myself almost with this idea of, yeah, let's create a catalyst, and then something will happen in it, and it'll be great, and it'll be open to the community. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think that you know everything art studio is wonderful. It's it's not about that, you know, and everything that. Everything that happens in every single project you do is wonderful, but the difference is that you're going in with an open mind. And for example, if you're working with children, that you're you're allowing them to open up and allowing them to experience things differently, allowing them to see themselves as in charge of information or in charge of how they process the world. So, if you're looking for a perfect, if if you're asking me what the most interesting things are in, in what I'm doing, it's not always the best piece of artwork. And sometimes that's the thing that ends up on a gallery wall. Yeah. But the, the most important moment might not be something that's the most beautiful thing. So it depends on your criteria, how you judge the value of, of what any of us are doing. You know, what's your set of criteria? You know, your funders might have a different set of criteria than the people who live in that area or the people who are participating in the work that you're doing. So it's up to us to set the criteria and then you judge by those criteria. I think that critical question though, that. It's a, it's a thorny one, but I, it is really very important. And certainly in, in the South, uh, working with NCAD, there's a, there's a learning development program. So undergraduate art students, uh, managed by Curate, they, they work with the community, they produce a, a, a body of work shown in the gallery. Um, some of them, they then make a decision. This is the area of practice that they want to go into professionally as an artist. 
upon graduation, and others go, I don't want to work with people, I want a studio. And I think that's really important to kind of not try and collapse everything into yeah, this, yeah. that there's a broad ecology of the arts. But the critical question, artistically, I think it actually, is actually remains pertinent. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I do want to work with people, and I do have my studio, and I do my own practice as well. So, you know, if there's something that I want to do that I don't want anyone else influencing, or that I want to have coming from me, and I want to be judged as my work by whatever criteria, um, that's up to myself. But I think there's a possibility of both, and one can enrich the other. Could I ask about uh, you, you mentioned that uh, community was problematic, and you know, <clears throat> but, but you start work for a, a, any community, uh, doesn't matter which, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, and that the, the, those communities are all driven by social class and by race issues and inequality and religion and that. Um, when you produce, sorry, any any form of art. Um, is it really the spectacle that's been produced, or does it have an educational value? Um, going back like, to the city, city of culture, with all those groups coming over and they sang and Radio One and all the grand, but you know, good entertainment, but is it cultural? You know, and I'm wondering if you have any, if, if the three of you, or four, you know, if you think that. Um, the whole purpose of what you do is educational. Is it to get people to think, or is it to put on an entertainment, or is, is it when people leave the theatre or the, uh, the the temple or, or whatever? I say I never thought about that before. That's interesting. And not or is it just to make them as they feel good? Is it a, just a pure spectacle? Um. I probably haven't resolved that yet. I know it's a the get out to cause answer, but yeah, that, that, so, like I, that's what I was saying. Sometimes I, I vary between the two of kind of the, the, the common good factor of a project or the fact that it's giving a resource to artists in the community or that it's, <coughs> not, it's generating a resource with the community on the ground or um, at the end of the day within that forum, do people want to go and look at not very entertaining or not very good things or uh, it's it, it's a really difficult one one to gauge I mean but I know if someone comes to me or if I'm researching a project and I, I, I'm researching an artist and they're exceptionally strong on on the kind of educational side or the kind of community engagement that will be enough and equally sometimes if they're just exceptionally strong on the kind of idea of spectacle that will be enough so I think there's room for both, to be honest. There's a real danger, I think, in this conversation for of a kind of hierarchy of one is better than the other, or one is because you don't want to. Would you agree that there maybe used to be that it used to be fixed, seen as one was more valuable, and it, it might be changing a little bit? To a degree, but I'm almost worried it's changing too far. I mean, like I, I, I can't understand people teaching, like doing a master's in socially engaged arts, just. Be an artist and engage. <laughs> it's white, white. It's just <laughs> what is the where? I know there are kind of fine points that you pick up, but conversation and human interaction, or or if there's aspects of sociological studies that you need to take on board, take them on board as part of your art practice. But it's unusual for me, for artists at the age of eighteen, to be deciding I am a socially engaged artist. It's such a. I think there is a. A kind of an educational undercurrent to it though, but not in the, the usual notions. But I think if we're talking about, broadly speaking, public art practices, I think the idea of what is public is such a politically pertinent question. So I think that in a way informs, has a certain kind of contour into what takes place, because in a circumstance where so much that people understand to be public land has actually been privatised um, and is actually privately owned. I think that question of the public is actually very interesting and very crucial. I mean, increasingly you can, and I'm not a great fan, I mean, there are examples that may be okay, but I think what has been quite interesting in the emergence of socially engaged, or the re-emergence of it, as it were, is that 
public art practices which formerly had been, okay, we'll have a sculpture and we'll plonk it there. There's been a, a re of that money for an artist to rethink questions of community and questions of the public. And that's quite a different um, kind of scenario because we were in that moment, you know, traveling on the motorway in the south, so it's like how much bit of public art kind of almost like litter that really had no sense of connection to place um, when actually this has been a challenge to that kind of standardised ideas of public art. And in particular, um, for really good examples of that, Rory O'Queeve is the public art manager for Dublin City Council. And the commissioning that he's been doing has been quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, for a city council to take that kind of level of leadership um, is, is profoundly heartening, I think. But I think it does connect to wider questions at this moment of a kind of an accelerated kind of privatisation when we talk about public art or socially engaged art and therefore ideas of common good, they're, they're, these are broadly kind of civic political questions. Which there are issues, I think, as well, sir, of, of partnership and, and who you're working with and who allows you to sort of take over spaces for work as well in, in terms of situating your work because. I mean, there is no way that a project at scale or something like the temple can happen without some kind of sanction. Um, it has to, you'd be surprised. has to protect it, doesn't it? It has you'd, to be. You'd be surprised kind of, uh, in this particular case. You'd be surprised. Surprise us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's hard to talk about, but yeah, no, there. Yeah. The territory is not... Um, territory is very, very... I mean, I can have my own bonfire at home any time I like, but <laughs> I'd love to do something on that scale, but it just isn't going to happen. And I think in some ways you have to jump through a lot of hoops to make big things happen, and maybe not everyone wants to jump through those hoops, and some people want to work smaller scale, and some people want to work kind of above the radar where everything's very visible and the outcomes are, are very visible, and other people want to almost keep the head down and just work away and yeah, very different. I think there's a variety of approaches and there was parallel some, approaches. So there were had some hands up earlier, so I want well, people, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just, the quite, well, my concern through the discussion so far is that um, I'm beginning to believe that socially engaged means critically and aesthetically disengaged. Um, and that's really the question of the panel. Um, I'm not a fan, I have to say, of projects like David Bess or projects like uh, Theodore Witness that we've had here recently and other projects like Dan Warren Cohen uh, and people who were here <coughs> trying to uh, uh, invest a uh, uh, socially engaged practice in the communities because I had a sense that they were trying to uh, sort of use this community in a way for uh, their own purposes more so than for better outcomes within the community. Uh, in that sense, um, that's why I think I'm answering my own question now that socially engaged art doesn't really mean critically or aesthetically uh, engaged art also. And the other opposite uh, pillar uh, that I'll offer to that <coughs> is the practice of people like Jimmy Durham Mona Hatton, Anthony Gormley work for Zerry Walls, um, Jimmy Durham's totem, which he basically uh, attacked British and colonial sort of imposition of military installations on the walls. Now, for me, those were socially engaged and critically and aesthetically engaged pieces of work, which I actually think have left a lasting legacy within this city aesthetically and critically. And socially. Um, my concern is I don't know if the best work will do that and that's the question I would ask. Is it in the memory in 10 years time of David Best's work will it actually really mean anything to the aesthetic or critical life of this community? Sorry, can I just come in quite later? Uh, the groups you mentioned there I was familiar with most of them but um, I would, I would like to say that when you mentioned the uh, theatre witness as not being uh, 
uh, as, as included in that sense of uh, using the community and not being in the way of a high standard. Uh, I can't I would like to disagree with you there very, well, I, I, very strongly. I'll accept, the, I'll, accept, well, I'll accept the fact that aesthetically mm -hmm. I don't believe theatre witness was a high standard and I don't think it was theatre. I think it was, well, play, I think it was play on people's emotions. I think that's actually very unfair to the theatre witness project. Given the work that we do in the garden reflection and our share space, story time, trauma healing and um, you know and those are all very important things in Northern Ireland and can be tied into the whole context of the temple as well. The theatre witness for the individual people that were involved in that project but also for the wider community was very very meaningful in terms of a healing process and the work you know I suppose people can agree or disagree as to the whether or not it was aesthetically good or not, you know, that's so sometimes just, quite subjective. So, so are we dealing with the realm of social work or are we dealing with the realm of Why can we not do deal with the re deal within the realms when you're looking at socially engaged arts practice? A lot of people don't understand or know, like David Best Temple, they're going, why are you burning it? What's the point? But when people have gone to the temple and seen the messages that have been left and people start to understand, and they, um, you know, ordinary people who don't necessarily engage in art in any shape or form in their daily lives, and they are starting to, they do get it on a certain level, and that's okay if it's, some of it is social. Like, what's wrong with that? It doesn't have to necessarily be about wholly and simply around the artist, you know, the artistic merits of that. That's you know, that that it, is not the point of the discussion. I think it's like what Helen talked about when she talked about falling in love. <clears throat> it actually hasn't happened to me yet, so I'm looking forward to it. You'll know when you know. <laughs> Why not <laughs> But, um, you know, when I went to Temple the other day with my children, and uh, I found myself talking to, sharing my secrets with some of the people that worked there, and I didn't mean to, and I didn't think that I would, you know, but it brought it out in me. And I suppose it's not very intellectual, I don't know what I'm saying, but isn't there? Um, a magic about art in that way, a magic about socially engaged art practice where it opens up people's hearts, not all the time but sometimes, but when it does, isn't it so beautiful? And it is about people's stories and it is difficult to put your finger on it. Does that make sense? But you see, I've had the same, do you know the Rothko room? Yeah. I've had the same feeling in the Rothko room yeah. and you can't get a less socially engaged artist yeah, probably yeah. than Mark Rothko making his I know 40 foot by 40 foot canvases in his studio and yeah. what putting them in a very expensive <laughs> restaurant in New York initially. <laughs> you know, it, 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 there was not, the, but yeah. so I th to me, it's again, it's the opt out cause, but it, it's not an either or. You know what I mean? There's not. I, I, I'd agree that the, it, it, in terms of the, the aesthetics and the criticality of socially engaged practice, because socially engaged practice is so kind of in vogue at the moment. Uh, lots of projects might be getting a free pass or whatever in terms of they're not prob they may not be up to scratch or but I mean there's lots of projects out there that have got that sense of intimacy or sense of feeling but also have got this engagement. I think as well that just uh, to, to go back to Rothko not everyone is going to be able to to go and be in that room you know it's the actual journey you have to make to get there and the decision that you'd have to make I want to go to an art gallery whereas this some is something that's imposing itself, placing itself within the community and asking a question, do you want to come and play? Do you want to engage? And that's the difference. The Rothko stuff isn't asking that question. It's, it's sitting somewhere and you're allowed to experience it and you're allowed to share it, but you have to make a, a, a much bigger journey to go to it. And the difference is that this is coming to you. And yeah, so I think it's quite different space. Do have another question? Well. Actually, maybe more of a comment. I think that 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 kind of political engagement and social commentary have existed in art since we started documenting art and artists. I think certainly since the Dadaist movement at the beginning of the 20th century, you begin to have multiple experiences where art becomes more of a three-dimensional thing. Kurt Schwitters and his Merck's Bows, and certainly the theater productions that Picasso worked on with Miro and, and the other people, began to take it out of the realm of a flat image on a wall. Okay? And 
I don't see these things as using a community or using an idea or, or, or taking advantage. I think, especially in terms of the city here and in, certainly in Belfast, when you drive past the murals, um, maybe that raises some uncomfortable questions within you. Sometimes it's a point of discussion. Uh, mostly, it's a learning experience. And it, you know, depending on, art is always what you bring to it and what you take out of it, you know, considering the point at which you're at. Um, you know, and I hate to see people say, well, maybe this is just using thing, or maybe we should whitewash the murals. And I know in Belfast, some of those murals have gone. If it's uncomfortable, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe you, know, you look at it and say, this is a prime example of what we shouldn't do. Or maybe these thoughts are not, are not the kinds of things that people should have. You know, these are things that you shouldn't act on. But I certainly think that it's wrong to, to just pretend that those things don't exist or to say that, that it's using or that you shouldn't actually go to a temple and read the messages. She's saying that it brought things out in her. You know, maybe that's the artistic experience. Maybe it's the level at which you look at these things. And using was the word you used again. And it brings back what Brandon said. <laughs> to say that Taya seven up and theatre room was, was using the community. I find that highly wrong. I disagree entirely. I find it quite offensive. Well, I, 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 find, I, know I, I, I find it offensive. Yeah, I find it offensive. Excuse me, I'm not going to interrupt you. You have time to speak out, friends. That she was here serving the community. Yeah. I, I just wish James Green had been. Uh, well, so I, I, I'm, just, I'm talking about the experience of having gone and watched it. Using the community. Well, I'm talking about the experience of having to go and watch it. How about to go? I didn't have to go. I went to watch it, right, and I felt uh, the most uncomfortable night of my life in terms of any theatre uh, or experience I've ever been in is watching people uh, emotionally disintegrate in front of me. Do you mean the audience or the... No, the, the people on stage. No, none of the people on the stage. The young guy who was the drummer on stage. He was stage. completely in control and he did that every night for whatever number of nights. And it was each night he did it, no, he I, was... Well, he he was, was talked talk to quite a large percentage Did you ask of him if he felt... So so quite quite did you ask him? I'm wondering whether we can draw out, uh, draw out from this really actually productive disagreement a wider question of how this work is understood because there seems to be two different modalities of comprehending this work. One is a kind of almost like a therapeutic system of meaning and the other is a critical kind of system of meaning. And I think there are almost two different systems of meaning and meaning making and also two different kind of practices and processes. And that actually, the nature of arts practice is that there's going to be some of that and there's going to be some of that. I don't know whether that. But Sally, you had a question that you wanted to previously. No. no. Okay. No, okay. Sorry. Well, sorry. I think what did you say there? So are you, you commonly like on our. <coughs> so there are two. There's two systems. He was in. What, what could you say again that you said? So there mm. seems to be two different systems of meaning. A therapeutic system of meaning, to quote from Frank Ferrudi. No, sorry. Uh, this was not therapeutic. No, that was his interpretation. No, 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 sorry. Witness is not his interpretation was. Therapeutic. Yes, but his interpretation was it that it was therapy. very clearly not doing therapy. Yes, but his interpretation was clearly that it was therapy. I don't hear him say that. Well, that's what I heard from your critique. Yeah, Because well, if you're say saying that, it made yeah. people work, yeah. So I think that how work is interpreted is also part of the contestation of the work. You can't say that someone's interpretation is wrong, but you can say that's not what my intention was. Do you know what I mean? Well, I suppose we all, we all come to things with our, you know, our own art history or art snobbery or whatever, like, until you actually go and see. David Best, you know, like Temple, like I go and have experienced things like that. You can't, you can't really have a, a judgment on it. Like the, the Turner Prize, there was a 2013. There was a whole hullabaloo in this town about the Turner Prize, and there were people calling it the Turner Prize, and you know, things like that. And 
maybe some of the artists that were in the, the, the thing that I, I, before I went, I didn't understand either. But when I actually went to the space and seen the way people were socially engaging as invigilators who, you know, I, I probably knew maybe as, as doormen, you know, like looking after and you know, to getting all this art, you know, it's, you, you, you actually have to experience it, you know, the thing and then, then you, you have a, a year or an A there on it, like, you know, until then it's, it, it kind of, you know, but, but what I'm saying is you shouldn't, you shouldn't really do something until you, you experience it. I don't, I mean, like, at the end of the day, it'll be artists will make their art and, um, it's a very ego, egotistical exercise, you know what I mean? Even socially engaged artists who don't foreground that, they're deceiving themselves or they're deceiving and they're trying to deceive everyone else. And to sustain an art practice is, is a massively egoistical or egotistical thing that you believe that you've got something that's worthy of putting in front of everyone else and that they will respond to it or they will it'll, it'll be of such a quality that people will engage with it. So there's no removing the, the, the ego factor from even possibly pieces that are therapeutic, you know what I mean? We all individually have a hierarchy of kind of concerns and because the concern of the, the person behind theatre of witness was one thing, it doesn't make it, should be every, at, at, the lev, at the maximum of everyone's level of concern. And it, there's the same to have a kind of individual taste in projects is, is fine also. I think also it is okay, in fact, to not go to see something and not like it, because there's lots of stuff I know I don't <laughs> like. And I, just, I, may, I mightn't have seen it or experienced it, but it's fine. You can't go and see and experience everything, and you don't have to withhold judgment on, on everything. You can go, it's just not for me. I just think it's go barking for the wrong tree. And then as, it's, like, it's interesting, the one thing that, that Temple does, and that lots of arts do, and socially engaged arts do, and even individual artists, they either kind of hijack public space, or they hijack emotional space, or they hijack kind of psychological space, and they will use it for their project. Now, at the end of their project, if they're socially engaged, or they're self-identified as socially engaged, they'll believe more that it's got a common good, or a sense of good, if they're an individual artist, and it's that classic thing of like, when a writer leaves a relationship, it's all good material, you know what I mean? It's not a, <laughs> they'll have gone through some trauma, but they'll, they'll, they'll be the ones who are able to use it as a piece of artwork. But, but I, I've seen myself, you know, like modern dance is kind of my thing that I, I tell myself I don't like. But I, I've seen me go to like a modern dance production and actually liking it, you know, like, so yeah. like, how do you know you don't like it? You know, like, what, what, what made me come to that conclusion that I, I don't like modern dance? Like? So it's, it's all perception. But I think the kind of contestation over work, that's actually, to me, that's the public character of the work. If there was just wholehearted agreement on the public value of the work, on its meaning, it would cease its public, the public character of the work would actually be diminished. I think the kind of contestation, so I don't know, so the people who really have are enthralled by Temple, it's touched them, and the people who have been unmoved, in a way, both have a kind of almost equal importance in terms of actually the meaning of the work, the fact that it can mean both. Well, if you look at, I mean, one of the big communal sort of traditions in, in Greece was everybody went to the theatre and they were looking for catharsis, they wanted to go there and feel something in common with other people, so it's a very primal need that, that something like Temple is, is answering, and it's been around for thousands of years. But what if, for some people, it doesn't answer that need? Don't go. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine, there's other things, you know? I don't think, though, that the thing about the theatre of witness, but what I found when I seen it was, it didn't make you think about violence. You know, you came out of it and maybe years ago you would, you would have given maybe your support to one of the paramilitary organisations. I don't mean actual physical support, but you might have supported them in here and say that, that's right. I think what that did was raised all that. 
and you think in the day and you know, and give us a wider context, like about violence in the world, even the geopolitical context of violence. You know, are we supporting this by keeping quiet? I mean, I think that's where, where that was valuable, and seeing you know different people that were involved actually speaking about it and saying why they were doing it at the time. And I think that in itself is educational. And I think that's what that, I think that's what that was particularly valuable. And that, you know, I think it was therapy, but I do think it was it was interesting and and it had an educational value and letting you question the things you might have thought in the past. But, and that, you know, but that's was only my opinion of it. Should we just, just the kind of, to wrap up any kind of burning questions that people have, maybe just because we have uh, our three uh, guests here to, to direct to the guests that we have, or any comments which are... Okay. Well, I'd thank you all. If, unless any of you have anything to say? Pardon? Is there, have any of you got a concluding comment? No. No, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just, oh, sorry, there is. Oh, it's just something that's coming up. Again, we're very keen to work with the partnership and um, we're delighted. We're holding a conference on the 14th, the 15th and 16th of April in the Junction at uh, Royal University Partnership. It's called Hope Beyond Heart. It's part of that Maria McLean Map International Award winning artist is going to be exhibiting her new war film here in the void, a partnership with ourselves, and she'll be doing a talk on the 15th of April along with her father, Pally Joe McLean, who is one of the hooded men. So she will talk about her practice and how her practice has been informed by her growing up as a child of the troubles in her life, her parents and her family life. And uh, we're really looking forward to another good partnership with our friends at the moment. And that information will be on the Void website? It will be, and it will be on our Garden Reflection website. Okay. So it's starting to come out now. And um, just thanks again to the Void. Um, it's just really interesting. Well, I wonder if you could all actually join me to, to, uh, to thank you, but also to thank the guests and our virtual friend. Um. <laughs>